going to, next week, make a transition between myth and symbol. And in order to make that transition, I've chosen something which we'll use um, again. We've used it before. And that is the little collection of poems by Rilke called Sonnets to Orpheus. So if you're uh, really following what I'm doing and you want to participate in it, and have something real happen, you'll get a copy of Rilke, Sonnets to Orpheus, and uh, read in it. You don't have to, as an assignment, read the whole thing. That's not what, what is going on here. But you will make the attempt uh, and uh, do what you can with it. The transition between myth and symbol is one of interiorizing language. In order to interiorize language, one has to have some idea as to what you are saying having meaning, and that that meaning has to occur as a presence of realization within you. If you are looking up the meaning of words in dictionaries all the time, the meaning will be in the dictionary and not in you. And those who pass out the dictionaries will control you. It's as simple as that. The only way, the single only way to freedom is to make your meaning independent of exterior authority. You cannot have a language which is defined by exterior reference and expect to be individual. It does not happen. It cannot happen. So we will end with uh, myth today. And you might notice that there are different dimensions to what we're doing. One of the dimensions that uh, is there, in addition to the books that we read, are selections of music. These Musical examples are meant to give a certain quality of tone, an affective tone. Um, feeling-based, yes, highly intelligent feeling-based, but capable of enduring acceptance and absorption and of sustaining themselves through a differential understanding. So the uh, music for myth was uh, Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade. And if you've been following the course, you have been listening to Scheherazade for the last three months. You can easily test yourself. If you haven't heard it at all, you're not in the course. Myth using Scheherazade as, an, as a feeling-toned cue changes to Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky in symbol. In other words, the use of Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov as an indicator, as a dimension trigger, as a feeling-toned cue, changes from Rimsky-Korsakov to Tchaikovsky, from Scheherazade to Swan Lake. Now, ostensibly on the surface, of course, there's no uh, difference in musical appreciation in just a general romantic sense between Scheherazade and Swan Lake. But there is a marked difference in the experience of the music. And with Swan Lake, an essence can be brought into play, which is a which expresses itself not only in the music, but that the music is a ballet, and that the ballet itself carries something essential, which is not in the naive sense of just experiencing the music. Let's say it's simple. If you listen to a record of Swan Lake, it's different from seeing the ballet. Now, one could choreograph a ballet to Scheherazade. I imagine it's been done. 
but the music is not written for that, and its characterization is that of a tone poem. Now, in between, Rimsky Korsakov's Scheherazade and Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, in that interval, when ostensibly you're taking a look at Rilke's sonnets to Orpheus, the musical selection is Meditation on Orpheus by the great American composer Alan Holanus. I believe that we have this musical selection on cassette, and if you don't have a copy of it, we can probably find that cassette and make a copy for you. The experience of listening to Scheherazade for the past three months would have given an added dimension to the three sets, the three pairs of books that we used in math. Now, in addition to the extra dimension of music in our consideration, because film, cinema, is the most popular and generally accessible art of our time, three films were selected to give an, a dimension, an added dimension to myth, and three have been selected for symbol. The three films that one could have seen if you were in the course, if you were doing the course, would have been Black Orpheus, Forbidden Planet, and Shane. The three films coming up for symbols, Wild Strawberries, Eight and a Half, and Field of Dreams. And again, like the musical selections, these films are meant to give you cues, to give you indications, to add dimension to what it is that we're doing. If you're not adding these dimensions, you're throwing away your opportunity. Now, when we get to symbol, because symbol is so very difficult, it was the first concerted effort in this whole education that I worked on, and I spent the entire um, summer of 1970 it's about 24 years ago, trying to bring together materials that could convey symbol adequate, in an adequate fashion. And the adequate fashion is, how could someone from scratch, the veritable man or woman on the street, come to having the quality, the refinement, the initial kindergarten level refinement to be able to take their own experience and realize internally that they had changed their experience by adding an internal dimension to it. How can we say this simply? If I am taking three books and I am juggling them, I have the experience of juggling. If I notice while I am juggling that the three books are Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Beowulf, and uh, the first book in Western history on astrology by Manelis, I suddenly begin to realize that I'm not just juggling books, but I'm juggling meaning. And it would be difficult, but one could put these together and find a common meaning, or one could have them separately. The point is, in order to teach symbols, you have to have a basic experience which you're having, and that while you're having it, you begin to get an itch of recognition. You don't have to know a lot. No one's asking you to know a lot. Someone is just asking you to be aware that something that you're doing has meaning, and that as you become aware of the meaning, the meaning changes. It becomes your meaning. And so, in two weeks, we start the investigation of symbols by the same method that we've been proceeding all along. We need a consistent method 
The reason for the consistency of the method is like a yoga. If you have a consistency of method, you become used to the method and it can recede to the background and you can begin then to direct your attention to form rather than being preoccupied by new methodology all the time. Once you learn to ride a bicycle and you get your sense of balance, then you can ride that bicycle anywhere. Then you can go places with it. And you don't have to worry about whether you're going to be able to ride it. So the use of the pairs of books all the way through is just our bicycle. It's just a vehicle. It's a methodological vehicle. And it's convenient. And it works. And so when we come to symbols, the first pair will be one novel by a woman and one novel by a man. And the novels are as close together in time as I could find, as close together in literary genre and style as I could find, because the importance is, is that there be a great modulation capable between the two, but that one be by a woman and the other be by a man. The woman is Virginia Woolf, the man is William Faulkner. Virginia Woolf's book is To the Lighthouse, and the one by Faulkner is As I Lay Dying. And you can find these everywhere. So we'll begin looking at symbols by having the experience for the first month, for the first four weeks, of reading Virginia Woolf and William Faulkner. Both novels are stream of consciousness style. If you at the same time as reading Virginia Woolf and reading William Faulkner will view the first of the three films, Wild Strawberries by Ingmar Bergman, one of the really great films in the world. So here you have a pair of books, and you have a film, and you have a musical dimension, Tchaikovsky's ballet, Swan Lake. And you might want to get a rent a video of Swan Lake, if you've never seen Swan Lake, if you've never seen the ballet. You might want to keep an excerpt of the music portion on a cassette and just play a few themes here and there while you drive around. But the basic thing, you need to at least three times, once just to look at it to become acquainted, twice to get reacquainted with it, and a third time to look at it in your own way. You want to see the video of the ballet at least three times. You want to see Wild Strawberries at least three times. The first time to get acquainted, to make friends. The second time to uh, get to know them a little better. And the third time to be aware of how you are experiencing this. I can assure you that there's a world of difference between the janitor at Bayreuth listening to Wagner's Gotterdammerung and Friedrich Nietzsche listening to Wagner's Gotterdammerung. There's an enormous difference. And what we're after is, what is your experience of this dimension? So with the added dimension of the film, with the added dimension of the music, and the added dimension of the year-long text that you're reading, either uh, Moby Dick or the Odyssey in this first year, the sections of Moby Dick or the sections of the Odyssey, you will have at least three other dimensions coming into play in addition to the methodology of the pairs of text going along. And then there'll be a fourth dimension, what I'm able to gift to you on Saturdays, a couple hours on Saturday mornings. I wish I had all the time in the universe. I would give you everything I have. I only have just so much time. Take what you can. It won't last. So that's what's coming up. Now we're ending our look at myth, and the last pair of books 
Keeping Our Methodology, were Language and Myth by Ernst Cassur and Myth and Reality by Mircilli Eliade. Now there are two sections, two little short sections in here that I wish to remind us about to bring our pair of books together for the first time. In Eliade, on page 41, he talks about how myths always, in their appeal to our experience, renew the world. Why do all peoples have myths? Because the world is renewed through mythology, through a continuance of mythology, the renewing of the world. And if we have time, if we can get to it, we'll see exactly mathematically why this is so. Yes, there is a mathematics to it. It has to do with the geometry that Pythagoras said was history. But I'm trying to keep it simple. It's much easier for me to talk complex. I'm much more at home in complexity. But I'm trying to speak just in a way, like a friend, so that it will be accessible for you. And if it isn't accessible today, that's all right. Get a cassette. Carry it around. In a year or two, in 10 years, it'll be accessible. It'll be there. Eliade says, it is easy to understand why the installation of a king repeated the cosmogony or took place at the new year. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, of course, that in mythologies, kings are commonplace. And that kings somehow, when they're coronated, when they're installed, all through mythology is the beginning of a time cycle. It's always a new year. No matter when it happens, that's when that year begins. The Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, begins at a certain time, which is quite different from the Persian New Year, quite different from the Chinese New Year, quite different from our New Year. All these different New Years are because there is a royal beginning in the differing cultures at different times. It can be at any time. One could even abstract out and make it very simple. When the royal soul of yourself first comes into being, that will be the first day of the first year of your real life. And you might commemorate that. You're free to do that. Eliade, talking about renewing the world, says the king was believed to renew the entire cosmos. The greatest of renewal takes place at the new year, when a new time cycle is inaugurated. But the renovatio, he uses the Latin term here, the renewal, the renovatio, the renewal, affected by the New Year ritual is basically a reiteration of the cosmology. He uses the term cosmogony here. We can use the term cosmology. It's better for our ear. In other words, the pattern of understanding the cosmos is bound up with a way of talking about it, and that way of talking about it has a beginning. And in order to understand the cosmology, one would have to talk about the entire pattern. You would not be able to understand the pattern if you do not begin at the beginning. Beginning at the beginning is the only way to hear a cosmogony. Why is that so? It's rather like in chaos theory of the late 1980s. The beginning determines the cycling and how the form is going to come out. Whatever characterizes in actuality the beginning is the ultimate stamp of the reality of whatever else develops. Simplistically, 
if I throw a pebble in a pond, all the ripples that come from that pebble have to have the same shape as the initial plop of that first pebble. If it's just ordinary pond water, the ripples are going to be of a certain nature. If it's heavy oil and the pebble goes in, the ripples will have a different nature. One can read from the ripples, from their characteristics, what the nature of the medium is. Because the ripples, the resonances of anything, are always going to be what the initial point was in actuality. So that if you get good at understanding the analysis of what's happened, of paying attention to the patterns of what's happened, one can then impute back and discover what the truth of the beginning was and know two things. You can know what the universe is made of because it will show in the kind of ripples and resonances it has. And two, you will know the truth of that universe because you will know its beginning. The most condensed form of this understanding was written about 2,300 years ago in Alexandria by Euclid in his Elements, Elements of Geometry. And the entire development of geometry comes from the point. Once one understands that we begin with a point, everything else follows from that. Understanding the pyramids of Egypt, <laughs> understanding whatever you would like. You can build buildings with geometry like that. You can build lives, you can do many things. All of it follows from the point. So too, if the universe is not renewed, it will exhaust its resonant supply from that beginning. Because time definitely has a kind of an effect where over time, over an expanse, the ripples will die out, the resonances will die out. This is extremely difficult, extremely important. It seems so simple on the surface, and yet there's a thorn here, a thorn which badgers every human being who has ever lived on this earth since the time of Euclid. You can think that it doesn't bother me because I live in such a way that it doesn't affect me. And I assure you, all the structures that manipulate us are conditioned by this one single thorn. They're all there. This is why it's so important that time be renewed. That time be considered as a patterned form which is healthful for us if it is renewed, if the cycles are renewed in such a way that a tired old time form is not allowed to become more and more tired and finally moribund. That time must be renewed, that the cosmos must be renewed that meaning and value must be renewed. And so Eliade, writing about renewing the world, says this is the number one. It's the only reason why mythology exists at all. To do this. Creation over again. Recreation. And it is by myths, both cosmogonic myths and origin myths, that man is reminded how the world was created 
in the first place and what happened afterwards and why it is now recreated again and what happens from that. It's extremely important. Now, paired with Eliade, paired with this, let's just hold this in suspension. Myth has an importance in renewal. Kasur, who understood this as well as anybody has ever understood this, points out that myth works in exactly the opposite way that logic works. Hard as it is to understand how myth works, once you do understand that, even if it's just in the conviction of the feeling tones of participating in it, logic looks like death to you. The life-giving renewal of myth is obliterated by the process of logic unless one makes a transformation, unless one understands that myth winds down a certain way and logic rewinds it back up. That they work in opposite ways because they are necessary to each other and that without the two together, you wouldn't have reality. It's as simple as this. With myth, you breathe in. And if you keep breathing in, you're going to burst. You're going to pass out. You have to breathe out. And logic is a breathing out. It's as simple as that. Here's how Kasura writes it. Page 90, Language and Myth. If now we contrast this form of logical conception by species and genera within the primitive form of mythic and linguistic conception, we find immediately that the two, myth and logic, represent entirely different tendencies of thought. Notice here he's not excluding myth from thought at all. But he's saying the mythic tendency of thought is exactly polar opposite of the logical tendency of thought. Whereas in the former, a concentric expansion over ever-widening spheres of perception and conception takes place, this is logic. In logic, concentric expansion over ever-widening spheres of perception and conception takes place we find exactly the opposite movement of thought giving rise to mythic ideation. The mental view is not widened but compressed. It is, so to speak, distilled into a single point. The whole nature of the movement of myth and thus of human experience, the whole movement of experience, its tides, its cycles, is to return back to that single point. That's why a mythic cosmogony is so satisfying, because it helps us to do that. It's very satisfying to do that. Experience loves that, recognizes that this is truthful to itself. And at the same time, if it does not undergo a transformation, gains an antipathy to the opposite. The logical expansion ripples are seen to be a destructive, a disintegrative action because they forestall are coming together. They forestall our return, our necessary feeling to return back to the point of origin, 
to get there because all meaning is there. And someone's analytical thought is getting in our way. They must be demonic. Now, this is a very crucial situation, as you might well imagine by now. Because this kind of double tendency happens within ourselves. Because we are capable of both. And by letting these two tendencies, in a naive way, go un-understood. I know that sounds redundant, but it's probably not. Letting them go un-understood creates a psychological sense of creating factions within ourselves. One of the mythic forms of that is a Jekyll and Hyde. Or someone says, well, my mind thinks this, but my heart thinks that. And by making factions, by making a political party, psychological entity out of the human heart, all of the heartfulness that is really there is obviated by a party platform. (laughs) And the same thing happens to the mind. And the truthful gorgeousness of the heart and the truthful, plain beautifulness of the mind are not seen, are not experienced, they're not disclosed, they don't happen. And instead, phantoms and shadows come into play. Or as Goya once showed in his uh, Capriccios, The Disasters of War, The sleep of reason produces uh, demons. And the anesthetization anesthetization of the heart produces hell. And so we have a hell populated by demons instead of spiritual beings who have hearts and souls who in reality can understand each other perfectly. Here's Kasur again. Let's listen to the part we just read and carry it a little further, but hear it a second time. Notice how repetition in this way is not dulling, but repetition in the particular way that we're doing it is like having further ripples. It's a technique. If now we contrast this form of logical conception by species and genera, With the primitive form of mythic and linguistic conception, we find immediately that the two represent entirely different tendencies of thought, whereas in the former, a concentric expansion over ever-widening spheres of perception and conception takes place, we find exactly the opposite movement of thought giving rise to mythic ideation. The mental view is not widened but compressed. It is, so to speak, distilled into a single point. Only by this process of distillation is the particular essence found. Only by distillation is essence found. Symbols are distilled out of myths. Symbols are distilled out of myths. The alchemical term is is the most apt term that there is. I assure you that that the the Chinese understanding of these terms uses Chinese alchemical terms, just as the West uses alchemical terms. And no accident, because it it is the whole rise of alchemy, both in China and in Alexandria, came from the same realization that experience, when it is distilled, produces essence. And that essence is what is real inside of us. And if we are only filled with experience and not with essence, then we are pawns for other people to push around who control the content and movement of experience. 
This is what makes a good party member. This is what makes mass movements, lynch mobs. It's us against them, and we have to get them. This distillation process, though, as uh, Kassur brings out, only by this process of distillation is the particular essence found and extracted, which is to bear the special accent of, quote, significance. Essences bring into play meaning. We keep saying and keep believing that experience is meaning. The experienced person knows better. This is not true at all. Take the example of farmers who plow a field for 50 years. They know all about that field because they have experience about it. And the crops just keep diminishing and diminishing because they never understood that you have to replenish the nutrients of the soil and let part of it lie fallow by planting alfalfa. Once one has the idea, once one has the essence, which is so much more powerful than just repeating experience over and over again, which exhausts its eff efficacy, so that in effect the world cannot be renewed without essences being distilled, without meaning coming into symbolic play which is why all religions seek to engender symbols in their adherents. It's extremely important because there's no way that we can return to our reality without symbolic essences that hold distilled meaning. This is extremely important and powerful. El, um, Kassura writes, all light is concentrated in one focal point of meaning, while everything that lies outside these focal points of verbal or mythic conception remains practically invisible. It remains, quote, unremarked, because, and insofar as, it remains unsupplied, with any linguistic or mythic maker. But in the realm of discursive conception, there reigns a sort of diffuse light, and further logical analysis proceeds, the further does this even clarity and luminosity extend. So the whole quality of myth is to be finite. The whole quality of logic is to be infinite. The whole movement of integration is to get somewhere, where? There at the beginning again. Whereas the entire movement of differentiation is to explore ever new into infinity. The two elements that cannot be there and a hidden third which is supposed to be there, but really can never exist in myth, are infinity, zero. And the one that's supposed to be there and really isn't is one. And it's absolutely catastrophic to not be free to live in face of and in view of, in relationship to, the infinite, the void, and oneness is not possible. The entire psychophysiological stability of oneself becomes unmanageable 
And that's why the addiction to the fanatic always has an addiction to the cause, because the cause gives all of these in surrogate form. As uh, the great uh, American philosopher Eric Hoffer, who was a longshoreman in San Francisco, wrote in his book on the true believer, the true believer is everywhere on the march, and he's ready for you to die for his cause. And it's even more insidious. You will convince those closest to you to die for his cause too. What's important for us in the second half is to understand an example of how this works, and I'm going to take the example of astrology. Astrology is the perfect example of a myth. It's the perfect example of a myth, and the mythic horizon of astrology is the zodiac. And once this example is given to you in the second part, and you can review a cassette tape of the first part, once you have the second part example, so that you, you get it, even just somewhat, go back and listen to the first part of this lecture, and you will see in there that there is a quality of freedom which has to be encouraged by invitation. No one can give you freedom. If I could give it to you, I would give it to you. All I can do is issue an invitation to you, and it's your response that makes you free. And it's very difficult to teach this because all of the traditional forms of teaching this are in themselves conditioned by certain mythic substrates and symbolic forms which encapsulate. One of the most insidious of all was the use of uh, Aristotle to become the underpinning of the Roman Catholic Church by Thomas Aquinas. There's nothing wrong with Aristotle as Aristotle. Aquinas as Aquinas was beautiful. But the combination of the two produced a devastation. What was the devastation? It meant that the mythic horizon would always remain the substratum that dictated the correspondence of meaning and in that substratum, even God was delimited. Not by any intention, I absolutely assure you. Aquinas uh, learned from his teacher, uh, Albertus, uh, magnificently. He would never have thought of that. But on his deathbed, Aquinas died at 49 just 49 years old. On his deathbed, Aquinas had a vision. And his vision was written down, and it passed through underground channels, and only surfaced in English translation because it was included as the third part of one of Carl Jung's uh, great works in Germany. the work that contains as its second uh, uh, part of the book Aeon. And when they were translating for Jung's collected works into English, and they trans came to translate Aeon, they came to translate the second uh, the part about the archetypes of the collective unconscious, they did not, they could not include a, the third part in English translation with it. It's not included in the collected works of Jung in English, but it is in German. And so a very special edition was made of it. And it's published in an even different color of book in the Bollingen series. It has a totally different number. It's called Aurora Consurgence. The Dawn of Realization. And Aurora Consurgence is Thomas Aquinas's deathbed vision that without transformational distillation, the soul cannot be free. And if our soul is not free, God's freedom 
is delimited by a lie. What is man's purpose in this universe? To confirm and cinch God's own freedom. Let's take a break. In our outline of the of the course, something which was written uh, <clears throat> in 1970, I think might be of um, use to us. This was a statement uh, written um, early in the summer of 1970 at a time when uh, this uh, particular program was being uh, uh, designed to go from San Francisco, from San Francisco State, which at that time had uh, suffered a closure because of uh, riots. And I carried it across the bay to Berkeley, and then Berkeley was closed because of the Cambodia invasion. And uh, finally I realized that there wasn't any place left open to teach, and so I went to Canada. <clears throat> and there, as usual, met with the uh, with the curious uh, stares of those who uh, are paying uh, huge salaries and wondering what they're getting for their salaries, uh, I wrote this uh, statement. In this humanities program, the idea is to fill in the gaps in interrelational spaces that have naturally developed in the contemporary world as a residual of increasing specialization. This specialization has taken the predominant form of well-defined subjects and accurately delineated processes. The universal application of the scientific method to entities and logical analysis to procedure has benefited everyone by presenting reasonably clear pictures of the world. In this act of focusing, however, the background has been eliminated the interconnecting tissues of the things and their movement has disappeared. Not from reality, as is so ignorantly lamented, but merely from man's microscoped perspective. This humanities program restores the consciousness of this background and the requisites of human character commensurate with the restoration. We're looking here at astrology as a myth. And this is not to say that astrology is fictitious, or that it's a lie, or that it's nothing. It is palpably really something. And what it palpably really is, is a myth. And its important quality remains forever as a myth. It's important. It's one of the most important myths uh, that we have in recent civilization. But it needs to be understood as a myth because it functions beautifully as a myth, is very serviceable. For styling and patterning experience, it's very, very usable. But it has its purpose and its purpose is to allow for the distillation of essences which are superior to it. And those essences which are superior to it, the symbols are distilled with the distinct purpose of further integration back to a single point. The only reason why anyone would talk about astrology at all is to understand one's place in the cosmos better. Why else, if it's just to make money, there are lots of better ways to make money. That distillation back to the single point is the place where the astrological mythic basis of astrology being symbolically distilled to ratioed relationalities and further integrated 
to a single cosmological point is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of a whole other mode, a differential mode. <coughs> and not to understand this or to have gone through this, one has two effects. Either people confuse logic with myth and they use logic as a myth, which does a disservice to everyone, and it's more prevalent than you might think. I would say less than 5% of science is done as science, and 95% of it is uh, just a ritual endeavor to support uh, local mythologies. Carl Jung once said uh, on one of the terraces at uh, the Iranus conferences, he said 90% of science is meal talk. It's higher than that. Because if we use logic in a mythic way, this accelerates the problem of fanatics taking over and making mass movements out of other human beings. It's called an ideational compression. It's called an ideology. And the difference between an idea and an ideology is that an idea is capable of, capable of differentiation and applicability, even to the point of science, whereas an ideology is useful for, for putting handles on other people and maneuvering them around. We want you all to dress this way, and we want you all to march in that direction, and we want you all to shoot them. They are the enemy. And as William James observed at Stanford University in 1910, we will have peace when we work as hard for peace as we do for war. And a lot of us have been busy a long time making sure that uh, we get what we like. All right, astrology is a myth. The mythic horizon of astrology is the zodiac. What is the zodiac? The zodiac is the apparent path of the sun in the sky, in the starry field, as seen from Earth. This came originally from uh, Babylon. The first astrological uses actually came from the time of uh, Hammurabi, about 1900 BC. And the Babylonians at that time, who were along the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers down in the valley, which is now Iraq today, they got their insight from a man who lived about four or five hundred years before up in the mountains. And his name was, in Greek his name is Zoroaster. Zoroaster in Greek means stargazer. Zarathustra. And what Zarathustra the sage had said 500 years before, they heard with cultured mythic ears that had never undergone the transformation that Zarathustra invited everyone to undergo. He said, there are luminous spirit guides for man who consist of pure light and they are the indicators of the pattern of life in this cosmos. And the Babylonians, who were great at building a certain kind of architecture, they were wonderful at building a very specific kind of architecture. There, the Babylonian architecture consisted of a maze of passages, all of which eventually dead-ended except one, and that led to the king's throne. 
And when it was put into a three-dimensional form, this maze of dead ends with only one place to really go became the ziggurat, a spiral that devolves instead of evolving, and it devolves until it reaches only one place, and that is the top. And so the ziggurat was always this architectural symbol of confusion. And we get today the metaphor, Babel is a confusion of language. The Tower of Babel is the ultimate ziggurat. This is the only confusion in the universe that there is. Even when two great galaxies of hundreds of billions of stars collide together, there's no chaos. It's complicated, but it's not chaotic. But a ziggurat, a Tower of Babel, is a confusion. And in a way, because we're the authors of that confusion, we're the only people who can re-edit it. Edit those, those errors. So that the spiral, instead of devolving, so that everyone serves one master. It goes through a transformation and it widens out. And everyone has a place of freedom. Now, one of the qualities that we're going to see in astrology comes about 2,000 years after the first beginnings of looking at the stars, thinking that those points of light in their patterns are what control by their influence the destinies of human beings. And the first instance in Western civilization of astrology entering into the public view is with the book which is translated here in the Loeb Classical Library, Manilis, the Astronomica. Actually, the Latin, the original Latin was Astronomics because Manilus wanted it to be held on, a sa on the same par with Virgil's Georgics. <laughs> because Virgil had been commissioned by Augustus Caesar to bring all of the language of the world into a single epic distillation, and that was uh, the Aeneid, which we're going to have a chance to read next year. And the Aeneid is an esoteric way of bringing all of the significance that the Latin language was capable of to a single point. The threshold to the mouth of Augustus Caesar. And Virgil did a very good job. Uh, he might have chosen a better um, focus, but at least he, he did a good job. And so Manilus wanted to get in on this, and so he dedicates his book without permission to Augustus Caesar. And he says this is the first time that anyone has written, has brought the esoteric truths of astronomy out into an accessible form. So this is the first book on astrology. Because the priests, the Babylonians, become by this time Chaldeans, the Chaldean priests were careful to marshal this material. You don't want to have too much competition. And so this book appears about 20 AD. The first couple of chapters appeared while Augustus was alive, and the last couple of chapters appeared after his death. And Augustus's uh, successor, Tiberius, was completely overwhelmed by Manilus's Astronomica. In other words, the Roman Empire was run by astrology after Augustus's death. Tiberius Caesar was convinced that it must be the ultimate wisdom, because this is the form in which the gods would pass it on, surely, 
and so he surrounded himself with astrologers. And the astrologers were very happy because they got to influence the first great world empire. And so before there was a Roman Catholicism to hold the Roman Empire together, there was astrology. And astrology is the first Catholic doctrine which the Roman Empire adopted from outside of itself to rule the world. as a new perspective to some people. In the history of ideas, it's very powerful to know this. Now, Manilus <coughs> says that stars, through their signs, indicate the control of influences. And that the signs are the constellations, the figurations of stars together. But in this figuration of stars together, in the constellations, the most important influences are from single stars that wander. Two points. The sun and its apparent movement of the heavens from the standpoint of the earth moves in kind of a sine wave. All energy movement seems from earth to be in this kind of a sine wave. The constellations that were made for the entire sky numbered about 88 but the sun only went through 12 of them, and so they became the zodiac. They became the crown of signs. But in addition to those 12 zodiacal uh, constellations, there were seven heavenly bodies that moved by themselves. There were the five wandering stars and the sun and the moon. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those five stars, the wandering stars, they were gods, just like the sun and the moon were gods. There were seven gods. There were seven. So notice here that there are seven spheres, seven gods. The Greek word for this kind of god was D-A-I-M-O-N. Diamond, demon. And later on, when Christianity came in and displaced astrology, they were called devils. And it became Roman fashion as early as the 60s AD, as early as that, for the Roman Jews who were making a proselytic Christian church to talk about these astrological gods as devils. And that's why as early as 65 AD, you have the mythic statement that Mary Magdalene was a woman who had seven devils cast out of her. She was that decadent. But let's come back to astrology. If we get started on this path, the story of civilization reads like such a tawdry mess that one would despair of ever being able to bring it together again. Uh, fortunately, the despair is misplaced because the confusion is only apparent. Nothing really is wrong. And all we have to do is wake up. One act cures the entire mess. It's true there's a lot of work to be done because nothing's been done for a long time. But men and women are never afraid of work. Only of each other and their supposed devils. So that Manilus, in his Astronomica, says the stars through their signness and their constellations control the world from heaven's order 
they're the gods, by influence. And that astrology, which is the science of this, was founded by Mercury, by Hermes, by Thoth, a great and holy science, Manila says. And that priests have kept this science, this holy science, and the practice of the holy science is an art, have kept this art and science. And these priests were held by a substrate of people who all their lives then offered sacrifice in temples. And the priests, because they headed these sacrifices in the temples all their life, voicing the people's prayer, secured by the devotion of this prayerful action, the sympathy of God. Now, secure is uh, meant to be here almost like loan talk. As collateral, we're putting up the devotion of the people. And in return, we get the information about how the world is controlled. And we can use that control then to better control it ourselves, like a loan guarantee. And in, in, incidentally, sympathy here does not mean like uh, tea and sympathy. It means uh, uh, that the vibrations are the same. It's very mechanistic, very stoic. The essential egotistical arrogance is that if we do this sacrifice right, God is compelled to respond. Because it's universal law and you better you you better toe the line. And as long as we do these rituals right, we get what we want. We have chanted exact enough and long enough, it's time for that rolls to get in the driveway. Where in hell is it? Oh, somebody else says, I've got a rolls. Well, who's your God? What did you do to get it? It's about on that level. It always is. But if we read Manilus and read the second part of the statement, we find a kind of a substrate left over from Plato, left over from Platonic philosophy, because astrology was new at this time. It was just received and it was still embedded in a wisdom tradition that was much more familiar, much deeper. The rest of the paragraph, the rest of that sentence, after secured by their devotion, the sympathy of God, their pure minds were kindled by the very presence of the powerful deity and the God of heaven brought his servants to a knowledge of heaven and disclosed its secrets to them. In other words, there's still the remembrance that God doesn't come because you did rituals right and he's got to come, but that when a space is made within ourselves, God is there because he inhabits that purity. That's where he lives. And it doesn't make any difference whether the temple without is covered with gold foil or not, as long as the temple within is truly a pure space. And if that temple within is a pure space, there's no way that God is not there. One of Rilke's sonnets to Orpheus, which you will read. The sonnets to Orpheus are split into two portions. And in the first portion, the sixth one, you'll read about how sometimes things are very difficult for man and it's real easy for God. <laughs> and one of the things that's real easy for God is to be there in the intervals between the words of man, in the silences of our prayer. God is there. And when we, when we learn 
to end our prayer, that's when we realize. As Jeremiah says, he knows what we need even before we say it. You don't have to make a shopping list. You think you're something different from who you really are? And who you really are is different from what's really happening? No way. This noble science, says Manila, Manila says this noble science and art to discern destinies dependent on the wandering stars was particularly accurate when one could determine the nativity, the first point of your life first point of your life, assigning to each period of time its particular events, noting an individual's nativity and the subsequent pattern of his life, the influence of each hour on the laws of fate and the great differences affected by small movements. Now, hidden in this, hidden in this kind of talk is the assumption, a pernicious assumption, that time is a thing. And that because time is a thing, it can be granulated, and you can measure the granules. And if you can measure, then you can make quantity correspond to qualities. Now, if you went to program this, this would be very difficult to write. But the glibness of the true believer who is on the mythic level, instantaneously makes all these jumps. It's difficult to write logically because it's full of flaws. You have to put all kinds of, of, of little uh, secondary gears into place to turn meaning around in very limited, delimited ways in order to make these connections. And they do. The logic of ideologies is incredibly uh, 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 smooth. Mein Kampf is full of it. As long as we understand, and a powerful idea here, is that time is not a thing. And so it cannot be granulated. And because time is inextricably there with motion, there's no way to granulate space or motion and a lot of other relationalities which then are derived from them. Manila says the whole efficacy of astrology is because even these wandering stars return to their places. They have cycles, and when we match their cycles with the constellations and their cycles, we get then this airtight um, uh, conviction. They return to their customary positions, so that there are unvarying sequences of fate, so that when we assign figuration, pointed to by repeated experience, we then build up the science of astrology. Now notice here something extremely difficult to catch has happened. Instead of meaning being a distillation of experience into essences, instead of symbols coming out of integration, what you get are projected correspondences. And those projected correspondences are meant to be the relational ties 
between quantity and qualities. And this jibes then with the granulation of time and space and of people also. The entire pattern of this is a closed system. All of this can function only if the ultimate assumption is this is a closed system. And the way that it was gotten around, because nobody's going to buy a tautology, no one's going to buy a short circuit, is that the closed system was made very large and was given the name fate. Even Zeus and all the Greek pantheon were subject to uh, the laws of um, Moira, of fate. In a closed system, there is no infinity and there is no void. And subtly, there is also no oneness. Because very subtly, the energy always runs out and always needs to be renewed so that the only way to keep it going is to have it an ongoing closedness. And this cinches and cements the closed aspect to it. So much so that uh, Mercia Eliade, in a French book at the turn of uh, mid-century, uh, 1949, I think he wrote it, and then it was translated into English. I think I bought a copy about 1958 or something like that called The Myth of the Eternal Return. And Eliade, being a real genius about the problems that one runs into when there are Stalins and Hitlers, loose with ideologies controlling hundreds of millions of people, one asks very seriously, how does this happen? And when you grind fine enough and you get down to the symbolic level where you can begin to out-transcend the ideological gunk, one comes to understand that the myth of the eternal return is one of the greatest myths operative in human life. And in a way, astrology is the best presentation of the myth of eternal return. At least it was the best before there were uh, religious doctrines that were found and uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, um, sophisticated of all the doctrines that was found to do this is uh, Islam. A closed system, fate, is the ultimate guarantee that astrology works. And as long as there's no infinity, as long as there's no void, and as long as one doesn't probe oneness too much, you can stay in this for hundreds of years, thousands of years. The only trouble is, is that psychic energy, human heartedness, the mind, all of these real things get tired in ruts. And so they have to be renewed in such a way that they're presented in different ways. We've got to have a new way of telling the same myth. And so there's a whole movement on today for people to find the myth of our time as if finding the myth of our time does anything but keep us back in Babylonian times 4,000 years ago. It is idiocy. We find that about 20 AD, Manilus is introducing astrology for the first time. He writes here that nobody before him, he says, uh, by the magic of song to draw down from heaven God-given skills and fate's confidence the stars, which by the operation of divine reason diversify the checkered fortunes of mankind, and to be the first to stir with these new strains 
the nodding, leaf-capped woods of Helicon, as I bring strange lore untold by any before me, this is my aim. You, Caesar, first citizen and father of your country, who rule a world obedient to your august laws, and merit the heaven granted to you by your sire, yourself a god, are the one who inspires my design and gives me strength for such lofty themes. Manilus was able to write that in Rome in 20 AD. About 230 years later in the same city, Plotinus writes that astrology is assumed by everyone that you meet. I talked Thursday night about how it takes about 150 years for an idea to occur in one person and then to just permeate life. 200 years later, it was assumed by everyone that this is the way the world works. And not only was it assumed by everyone, I mean by almost everyone. There were only handfuls of pockets of men and women, like the students of Plotinus. Plotinus taught out of his home. Wisdom teachers don't fill universe uh, stadiums. Plotinus takes up the issue in the, uh, in the collection called the Aeneids, the second Aeneid, if you ever get to uh, take a look at Plotinus. There are four tractates in the second Aeneid to look at, if you ever get there. The first, the second, the third, and the seventh. The first is about the heavenly system, and uh, he writes here, uh, about the order of the heavens, how there is an order, and how it is quite different from the order that's assumed. The second is the heavenly circuit. What about the movements of things, and why are these movements ordered? And the third one is about astrology in particular, are the stars causes? And the seventh one is an esoteric uh, one about complete transfusion where Plotinus says that when two things come together and completely interpenetrate each other, there must be on the phenomenal plane disintegration. So that the only way to guarantee that a single reality by interpenetration preserves is that the essential idea of both must maintain its clarity because ideas can come together in this way, but that there's disintegration of every other level before that. It has to be. It has to be. It's the same thing as life and death. The sphere of life cannot cross into the sphere of death without disintegration. But the soul passes easily. There's no problem whatsoever. None. Plotinus, in junking Manilus two centuries later, and uh, don't think that it was junked once and for all, the good guys win only for a few. Usually in history, the bad guys hang on for centuries. With fame, money, disciples, and all the other good stuff. No Rolls Royces for Plotinus. Plotinus says, in order to understand how all of this has taken effect, really, one goes back to Plato, and Plato brings up in the Timaeus, brings us to the spindle destiny the spindle of destiny, that the original image, and remember now that myths can only move by images. If you integrate to the density of a symbol, the whole mythic horizon is permeated. You have to stay 
on the level of images to stay in the mythic horizon. As soon as you get tighter, you fall out of that mythic horizon. This is the whole nature of the, of the fall. The fall of man is, uh, it was called in the wisdom tradition, the paradox of the fortunate fall. You have to fall out of mythology. Where do you fall to? You fall into inner meaning. And so people who are clinging white-knuckled to the image base of a mythology because they're afraid they're going to fall are forestalling the development of an inner self, of an inner world. Why should they be so fearful of an inner world? Because that way leads to a transformation where myth doesn't work the way it did anymore. And so one keeps trudging with heavy burdens up the ziggurat of the chief guy. Because if you don't do that, then what are you going to do? You're going to have to deal with life yourself. Heaven forbid. Plotinus says, this brings us to the spindle destiny spun according to the ancients by the fates. To Plato, the spindle represents the cooperation of the moving and the stable elements of the cosmic circuit. The fates with necessity, mother of the fates, manipulate it and spin at the birth of every being so that all comes into existence through necessity. In the Timaeus, in the dialogue of the Timaeus, the creating God bestows the essential of the soul. In other words, the essence of the soul is bestowed at birth. Now notice here that the essence of the soul is quite distinct from influences that impinge from without. Because the essence of a soul is already on deep level of symbol and idea. Much more powerful than any kind of destiny which has image correspondences in terms of correlation. So that one has to veil someone's reality in order to get them to begin to believe in image bases as a more adequate substratum for living. The natural person is not going to deal with it at all. The only time that children displace play by belief is when you tell them stories. When you're telling stories to children, they're caught up in the mythic horizon. And they need to be, because they need that maturation. But really, young children have difficulty listening to the story because their first inclination is to play, which is an expression of freedom, incidentally. The soul comes in free, absolutely free. There's no way that there are any handles on it whatsoever. And it takes conditioning to build up enough layers of veil to make a sediment so that someone then has a ground upon which the ego can be not grown, because egos are not grown, egos are stamped. Egos always bear the stamp of approval with the serial number of the makers. You can take any ego in higher analysis and you can find out what worldview made this, what ideology, factory it came out of. And it becomes actually very tiresome because all the models are the same. As Henry Ford said, you can have any color Ford you want as long as it's black. Plotinus says, beautifully in his uh, work, 
he says that the only way, I, I can't find it right now, he says the only way that the images can be maintained is that they must be re-imaged. Because images eventually run out of their energy, their power, because they have no power of themselves. Have an image of an orange, either in your mind or in your taste bud, how long can you keep that orange orange? Images run out, so they have to be renewed, they have to be re-imaged. And so the whole purpose that's disclosed in this for a mythology is to constantly renew itself by keeping telling the stories. It's only as long as the stories are being told again and again that they work at all. And once you break, once you cut a mythological tape, it never works the same anymore. Even if you put one hitch of doubt, just one hitch of doubt in somebody's storyline, it begins to have its effect, it ripples out. This is why one in a traditional uh, custom-bound um, culture will not allow anyone to have any news of any other culture. It's like the Soviet Union never allowed its people to even know about each other's culture. It came as a complete shock to the young Russian boys who were returning from Afghanistan that the Afghanis were, were not at all uh, Soviet citizens like they'd been told. They didn't want to be Soviet. The machines don't want that either. <laughs> Next week, we're going to look at Rilke at the Sonnets to Orpheus. Please try to get a copy of Wild Strawberries by Bergman and, and just acquaint yourself with the film. Just look at it. And please try to get yourself at least the music to Swan Lake better to get the video of the ballet. And when you're looking at Swan Lake, I'm visualizing now uh, Nereyev's and uh, Fontaine. When you're visualizing that, notice how the images of the swan that are constantly there but do not remain mythic because the way Tchaikovsky's ballet moves is that the images of the swan integrate and deepen so that eventually what becomes operative in the ballet is the symbol of the swan rather than the images of the swan. And as the ballet progresses, there's a quality. It comes, uh, if you're listening to the, the uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the, um, the time frame on CDs, but on the old um, uh, 33 and a third records, Swan Lake fits on six discs, six sides. Three discs, six sides. The sixth side of the recorded Swan Lake has a transformation where the symbol begins to be expressively powerful rather than the images. And the mythological qualities of Swan Lake transform and become a symbolical ballet. And that that transformation is carried by the figure, um, uh, the, the version I saw, Nerea, carried by the male dancer. But he carries it not to himself, but he carries it to her. And she is the one that manifests it. She shows that she is no longer just doing images of the swan. She has become the swan. And the whole glorious freedom of that ballet is that she really, on the stage, shows that the symbol is what is real now through her and not just the images. That her appearances as a swan were a lower level, all gone now, and that she really is the artist who is the swan.
And in this way, Tchaikovsky shows how art rises out of culture to such a glorious way that in its transcendence, it fills us with a feeling that we call freedom. And what comes resonantly out of Swan Lake as one walks out of the theater is the kinesthetic quality that human movement on a, the, the deepest level of comp comprehension, that we're free. That's a lot to know. Next week, welcome. Mm -hmm.